Hey everybody and welcome to the One Wildlife Podcast with me, Abby Barnes. This is simply a show about life and as such there are no boundaries to where our conversations can take us. Along the way we simply aim to inspire, empower, educate and uplift, exploring how we can all live our best lives every single day. Before we get started, I want to mention that this podcast is hosted by Spend More Time in the Wild, which I founded in 2016 to help individuals get outside for the benefit of mental and physical health. Over the last few years, the project has grown into a worldwide community of passionate and courageous individuals working together to enjoy the beauty of our wild spaces and protect them for generations to come. You can find out more about both the podcast and wild by visiting www.spendmoretimeinthewild.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening or head on to YouTube to watch the full episode. Bex Band is the founder and director of Love Her Wild, a registered non-profit female adventure company established in 2017. It has since grown into the largest of its kind in the UK with over 25,000 members. Through Love Her Wild, Bex aims to make adventure more accessible to women and has raised more than 10K for charity, removed over 10,000 pieces of plastic pollution from waterways and set up eight mentoring programs. Bex is a professional adventurer too, boasting an impressive array of previous explorations. And she's currently in the throes of organizing a women's end-to-end -end relay, a world first hiking relay covering the length of the UK. Alongside this and everything else, she has recently published a new book, Three Stripes South, following her thousand kilometer journey along the length of the Israel National Trail in 2016. When she's not running Love Her Wild, Bex is a mum to her daughter, Rivi, and a passionate advocate for environmental conservation. I have no idea how she fits it all in, but we're gonna find out today by chatting with Bex herself, who is here with us. So good morning. Morning. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a How big fan. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> How are you doing today? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. Um, like I say, busy, but good. <laughs> busy, but good. I like that phrase. Well, first off, massive congratulations um, on your book. How does it feel to have a physical copy of your very own writing? Yeah, that is a uh, very, uh, very, very surreal feeling. I think um, actually writing a book has to be one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, such a life dream, uh, something I've always wanted to do since I was little. Um, and that moment that I first held it in my hands, it was just like, gosh, like, how does this happen? It, and it's mad, like the whole process of writing a book, because it's um, you just kind of chip away at it. And it's such a long process finding an agent and then publishing and then all the editing. Um, it's kind of hard to know at what point you celebrate it, but definitely when I had it in hand. Um, yeah, it's a good feeling. Amazing. How long did it sort of take as an overall process just out of interest? Gosh, well, you know, it'd been brewing in the back of my mind for a long time that I wanted to get this story down. Um, and then really from properly sitting down and writing a proposal and, and, and sending it out to try and find a literary agent um, to then being published was about two years, which actually in the publishing world is quite quick. Um, I think maybe because of COVID, um, uh, well, I, uh, the brat who published me, I know were stripping back a lot of their books. Um, and, and so I think they had a bit more time than normal. Uh, but yeah, two years is, is a long time. <laughs> it was quite hard <laughs> to kind of stay motivated. Well, it's an amazing read. Um, me and my partner, we we decided to sort of read it out loud to each other. It took a few months just because we were on a big expedition, but it travelled the length of the UK with us on Abbey Bikes for us in the last year, and we finished it up a couple of months ago, and we felt thoroughly inspired by it. So would you mind, without giving too much away, diving in as to what the story is about? Sure. And by the way, I love that you, I think it's such a cool idea reading it out loud to each other. Um, <laughs> so the story is about my first big adventure. Um, I really do not come from an outdoorsy background at all. Um, and I found myself kind of in my mid twenties, uh, quite unhappy and living in London and uh, just on this cycle of, of really struggling to find work that I kind of enjoyed and I found fulfilling and on a whim decided to sign up to hike the length of Israel um, with my husband he's originally from Israel um, and so when I it was actually a National Geographic art article that I saw that was about the best long distance hiking trails in the world in the world and it was Israel 
um, that really stood out because of my husband and it was a country that I wanted to find out more about. Um, so I signed up to do this hike. Uh, as you can imagine, it, you know, it took two months, went through the Negev desert, uh, was completely life changing. And it just tells the story of that hike and really where it took me at the end with um, increased confidence, self-esteem and then launching Love Her Wild, which is the women's adventure community that you mentioned. That was a very good whiz through. I'm quite impressed by that. And also I love how you just drop in, oh yeah, walk through the desert. And you know, it's like, well, walk through a desert. (laughs) Um, And that's what was uh, for me, one of the most fascinating things about this read is it's a very hostile environment quite often that you're walking through and you've got a really nice balance of sort of how you felt when you were out there, sort of the things that were a bit intimidating and your personal journey as you grew more confident in your equipment and your body and learning to read the environment, you know, from the water drops and having to prepare for that. And, you know, the time that you dropped your walking sticks down the crevasse and people um, managed to find them for you. And just the sense of community there, like you cover so much ground in this book and it's got a really, really nice pace. Um, And I wonder sort of with that, whether you could just share some of the personal highs and personal lows of your thousand kilometer trek mm, um oh that's a hard one because it's you know in every single day on the hike it's such a roller coaster and although you'd have days that were generally felt a little bit easier or um, where you were really excited or really engaged with the walk and then other days that for some reason were just really tough and your headspace just wasn't there um within every day you would just get these real moments um, of of excitement and just feeling like, gosh, I can't believe I'm here and look at this views. This is so exciting. Like what an adventure. Um, and then an hour later, I can just feel so like down and negative and I'm tired and exhausted and hot and just feeling like the whole challenge is too big and it's all too much. And uh, it's just too damn dusty and hot and dry and I want to go home. Um, And so in every single day, I would kind of feel this whole, feel these whole range of emotions. Um, But obviously like as the journey went on, I definitely felt like that steadied out a little bit. And uh, generally the hiking got a little bit easy. I always say it never got it never got easy, but it got easier. And I got really comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and the weight of my backpack, um, I became like familiar with that. So that became a lot easier. Uh, and then towards the end, you know, the desert for me was the real highlight. So it felt like there was, it was kind of a hike of two halves. Uh, so the first month was through towns and villages and we followed the coastline um, to Tel Aviv and then Jerusalem. And then the second half is in the Negev desert. And that really was the first time in my life, I think, that I've been in, you know, proper, proper nature, like miles from civilization, Uh, could go days without seeing anyone. Um, And it was absolutely beautiful. I'd never seen views like it. And we were camping and walking and living in this environment. And that was really quite amazing. And I just found in the desert was really where the transformation for me happened, that I just felt all the strain and stresses of my life and all all the kind of stresses we carry around as adults just kind of melt away. And I just had this amazing freeing experience where my days were really simple. It was just about getting up and hiking. Um, There were very few decisions to make because, you know, I carried two sets of clothes, one that I hiked in, one that I slept in. My food was planned for every day because we had to be meticulous with the food we were carrying. So life was really simple. I really just had to pick one foot in front of the other. Um, And that could become quite boring and monotonous at times, but it was also strangely creative and freeing. And it gave me all this headspace to kind of just work out who I was for the first time um, in my life. Uh, And so, yeah, the desert for me, just spending those weeks being in nature, surrounded by these beautiful valleys um, and yeah, the vastness and kind of soaking that in was the real highlight. I can really relate to the way you share the simplicity of life on the trail actually it's uh I got so pumped reading your book it's like, I have to go on an adventure now I was like I'm on an adventure <laughs> calm down <laughs> um, just I, I have all the questions here we can go in any direction but the first thing I, I want to just ask quite simply is do you miss life on the trail oh so much and writing that book 
I, I wrote the book when we were in the first lockdown and I was just like, man, I just want to go on a hike again <laughs> at the point. At, at that point, I was uh, I was heavily pregnant, so it wasn't going to be happening anytime soon. But I really do. I really miss it. Just the simplicity, the adventure, the excitement, the nature, the people you, you meet. Uh, yeah, I, it's quite addictive adventures. And like you say, I'm exactly the same. I'll be on an adventure and I'm already planning the next one. <laughs> and I have to remind myself, hold on, like enjoy this one first be in the moment yeah <laughs> <laughs> well along the way in the book you share about uh your passion for for writing and um your journey of starting a blog or picking up blogging again when you're back out there um and and I'm, I'm interested for you to share with the listeners um sort of the story that you tell in the book of when you were younger at school and how sort of your writing experience went there the feedback that you were getting as it were um and sort of how you overcame that noise in your head to having the confidence to write when you're out and about on the trail yeah so I I'm dyslexic so I really didn't do very well at school um academically well actually in any areas of school I didn't do particularly well um so my memories of, of being at school and sharing my writing were always negatives. Uh, the feedback I was getting from teachers was that uh, my writing was scruffy, they couldn't read it. Uh, my spelling was always terrible, it still is. Um, and so I just assumed, even though I loved writing and when I was really younger, I used to make up stories all the time. And then when I got to secondary school, that, that stopped entirely because I just had, was telling myself that I, I'm not a good writer because if I can't pass my English classes, if people can't understand what I'm reading, then obviously I'm not a good writer, um, which isn't true, actually. Mm. <laughs> and um, that's kind of what I discovered on this journey that we like to, well, we don't like to tell ourselves these things, but we do tell ourselves these things and we start to create stories based on the feedback that we get from other people. And often it's not true. Um, and so even though I loved writing and this was something that I was always really enthusiastic to do because of uh, my experiences in school, I, I stopped doing it. But then when I signed up to do this hike, I think it was, I, I'd, I'd had this idea that I wanted <clears throat> to launch a blog for a long time. And I think I just felt like no one would read it. There was like, I was a bit embarrassed to do it. Like, oh, what would people think? when I had the Israel hike it suddenly felt like oh well now I've got a good excuse because I tell people oh I'm just um I'm just launching this blog so that people can stay in touch and and I can you know it's just for me it's not for other people I used to say things like that which is such a lie <laughs> I really wanted people to read it um and so it gave me an excuse I guess to to kind of uh, set up my blog uh, and I love I just I loved it so much I still love blogging um a lot I really like the process of writing They're almost like you know short stories and crafting a short blog uh, and while I was on the trail um my readership started to grow and especially when I was reaching the end and more and more people that I didn't know were following my journey and I thought that was really exciting uh, and then at one point as well I bumped into so before I left I actually put blogs together on the kit that we were taking and the route we were planning to do and on the trail I actually bumped into someone who recognized me because he had found my blog and said the kit list he had pretty much followed it uh, and to, to put his own kit together for the trail and it was really helpful and thank you very much and I was like this is so surreal like I actually helped someone this is amazing uh, and and so that's uh, that's really how my blog came a uh, claim about uh, and in the process of blogging and with anything I do actually where I have those negative uh, thoughts in my head and I have preconceived ideas of what I am, am and I'm not good at I just find if you can be a little bit brave and just put yourself out there, then what you'll find is with each step, you start to break down those negative, that negative thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so over time, each time I got like, you know, a nice comment about my blog or I'd go on and I see that, you know, a few hundred people have read this blog. That's really exciting. And all these little positive things would start to build up. And then over time, I just really learned to ignore this negative thinking and to start changing the stories that I tell myself mm. um and and here I am now I've written a book which is amazing it is amazing and thank you for sharing that actually I think definitely there's a lot of inspiration to be drawn from that process that you you, you explained there that you went through because we all have those 
critiques and naysayers from from the word go generally still are sitting in our head and it's like will you just please go away now <laughs> and sometimes you're right we do have to find our brave and just just keep showing up um and gradually build our confidence and belief in ourselves and it's very important i feel as well to surround ourselves by people who encourage and believe in us as well even when we make the mistakes you know they are there to learn from and we don't have to fall flat on our face and not get back up like you know we are incredible powerful beings and i think you're certainly living that out which is which is amazing so thank you for doing that and for all oh, of the thank blogs you. that you share <laughs> Um, so I'm interested because, you know, you, you started writing these blogs and people were reading them and then you finished the trail, um, which is a high and a low, as I'm very familiar with that feeling. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did Love Her Wild come about then? Because not everybody turns their passion into an actual thing, a career choice or, <laughs> yeah. or a direction in which you want to travel. So how did how did all that go? Yeah, so, so Love a Wild came about because I noticed on the trail um, that I was the only female um, the, the entire two months. I didn't meet a, a single woman doing the full trail. And before doing the hike, I decided to sign up to do a few courses and first outdoor first aid and navigation, things like that, so that I was a bit better prepared. And almost entirely, again, I would be the only woman um, on all these courses and then as I was reaching the end of the trail, this really started to um, uh, kind of sink in a bit. And I was just thinking, for me, it just seemed like a real shame because I'd taken so much from going on this adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think especially as women, we have a lot of added pressures in society to act a certain way and look a certain way. And adventures are just a great opportunity to really escape all that. And it just seemed like a real sad thing to me that more women weren't accessing the outdoors and they weren't um, looking for adventure in their lives so I launched the Love a Wild community which really just started out as a Facebook group at the time um, I definitely didn't envisage how big it was going to grow and how it was going to become my career but when I finished the hike I definitely I'm always a bit tentative when I say that because I really don't like this idea of like, oh, it just happened accidentally. Like I worked really hard for it. And when I finished the trail, I had all these different options ahead of me. I had and lots of different things I was working on. So I had my blog and writing. I was giving started giving talks um, about adventure and inspiring people to get outdoors. I launched Love Her Wild. Um, I started thinking about organizing my own adventures and events. So I had lots of different things that I was working on and I was working really hard at all of them. Um, and really, it was Love Her Wild that massively took off very quickly. Um, and and it was just a really easy thing for me to put all my energy into because I was really passionate and excited about it. Um, and that's always quite good advice that I, I try and give people if they're thinking of <clears throat> changing their careers and uh, building a life on passions is to rather than just focus on one thing, maybe try lots of different things that you enjoy and are passionate about and then see what sticks and basically throw more energy into that. Uh, and so Love Her Wild now is a really big community um, with thousands of members and um, I've got a wonderful team that help uh, run the community and organise all female adventures and meetups across the UK and also overseas in, in non-COVID times. Um, and we have a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, and so it's been a mad few years and like <laughs> pretty full on, but it's been just incredible and exciting. Um, and at the, you know, as well as being able to do something wonderful and kind for other people um which always gives me a real feeling of like satisf satisfaction and fulfillment um I've also managed to build a dream career for myself where I get to work for myself which I love and that gives me a lot of flexibility and I get to travel lots and meet lots of people um so really it's been a win-win <laughs> a win-win like the sound of that yeah. uh, what would you say especially sort of with your focus on on um all female activities and getting more women outside are some of the barriers that women face in the outdoor community at the moment um do you know what I really think I see it time and time again and we did a really big survey actually actually last year in Love Her Wild which confirmed this um it mostly comes down to confidence I think um, most women are massively lacking in confidence um I have very low self-esteem 
And so when women tend to sign up for the trips and, you know, speaking to them before a trip and um, they're asking me questions, like it's just it just comes down to lack of confidence they think they're not going to be fast enough to keep up with the team that they're not fit enough that they're not experienced enough um and that fear stops them from from stepping out of their comfort zone and signing up to do things like adventures which is why a women only space is really important because it's just an easier first step and um for women that are lacking in confidence and perhaps being really nervous to take that first step um it just provides a um, a less intimidating, more supportive environment for them to do that. Um, and so really, that's what it comes down to. And that's why really adventures are so amazing, because they're all about building confidence. And so the idea is that women can start coming on our adventures, and then they, they go away feeling a little bit more sure of themselves and a little bit more confident than when they started, so they can then take that into their real lives and go and do adventures of their own. Mm, amazing. What would you say is your proudest moment so far since setting up Love for Wild? Mm. Well, I did, there were two women that met on one of my trips. <laughs> and that, I, I mean, I, I know that lots of women have been affected by Love for Wild, um, but that's like a really tangible thing when you're like, look how happy they are. Like, that's because <laughs> I created the trip and it was in Japan. Actually, we were hiking Mount Fuji and we were doing uh, a, a women's pilgrimage hike in rural Japan, like a really cool expedition. And these two women uh, came on that trip, um, fell in love. And I got to give the best man speech at their wedding last year, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, and it was just really nice to see like to actually see that, like the difference that I've made in other people's lives. And I felt very proud and that was a wonderful day. <laughs> that sounds cool. And I love that you've got so many international things going on as well. Um, it, again, it sort of really speaks to, we are not just a community in our immediate environment, but a worldwide network of people who are passionate about the outdoors. And um, speaking of passion for the outdoors, one of the things that you generally steer your focus onto is environmental conservation. Um, where does that come from, that, that interest of yours? Um, so really, it's kind of strange because when I think of myself now being really passionate about the environment, in my head, I've always been passionate about conservation, but it's actually not true. Uh, I think it was that hike in Israel that really cemented that passion. And it was the first time that I saw the damage uh, that we're doing on the environment firsthand. Like when we're in when we were in the desert, we were passing these quarries and factories like they have these huge conveyor belts that cut through the Negev desert, um, taking minerals from the Dead Sea, which is um, which is slowly reducing each year. It's um, under a lot of threat because people are taking minerals out to then put in beauty products. But they're not allowed to have factories next to the Dead Sea. So they build them miles away and then they just cut a conveyor belt through through the desert. It's absolutely mad to see and it's heartbreaking. Um, and I had this real contrast that I was falling in love with nature and then on, on one hand and then on the other hand, I'm seeing these horrible quarries and these factories and the Dead Seas reducing, yet we're still taking minerals out so that we can package it and, and you know, into bath salts to sell around the world. And it just made me so angry. <laughs> mm. um, and, and that's really where um, my passion kind of began. And it's really grown uh, grown from there and I've made a lot of uh, changes with um, my, my spending now I only buy things secondhand um, I try and live as modestly as possible I've moved to a plant-based diet um, I, I, I really am very my 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 downfall is traveling and obviously we all know that flying's bad but I try and uh, travel a lot more consciously if I do take a flight I try and um, combine work and travel so that I'm reducing the amount I'm flying um, and so it's really had a lot of a really big impact on me and and resulted in a lot of changes and now also um, I'm studying a master's uh, in, in wildlife conservation which I'm really enjoying I'm doing that part time um, over the next couple of years. Just, a, just another thing that you're doing. You know? <laughs> um, My husband literally rolled his eyes. When I, said, <laughs> I think I'm going to do a master's. He was like, what now? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, just amazing. Yeah, I think that the environmental thing is something, again, 
I mean, maybe just before we, we hit record, you know, it's sort of highlighting, I feel like we're on somewhat of a parallel journey in, in many ways. And this is certainly one of the ones, that, again, I, I really resonate with you, uh, like you, plant-based diet, trying to live as environmentally sensitively as possible. Um, you know, trying to look at my traveling in particular, because it's just the way it is. And then you're like, oh, can I offset? Does that really work? Like, what does recycled actually mean? And you can get so lost in this world. It's like, you know, you can be plant based and have a very serious impact on the environment. You know, you you really do have to have a level of consciousness and awareness. And at times it just becomes noise. Um, and you're like, what can I actually do living in this country surrounded by people who are really not conscious or caring about the environment? Um, and, you know, that's what's really nice um, about you is being sort of having created this community, you can translate those messages down through all the people who are getting involved with Love Her, Her Wild and help people understand that actually having a more compassionate approach towards the environment is, it doesn't have to be complicated, um, you know, and it does start with that awareness. So what would you sort of say to somebody who, you know, they love getting out hiking or biking or whatever it is, something outdoors, um, and they're really for the first time starting to consider their impact and relationship with the environment. Like what, what could they do to start to take some steps towards almost giving back, I guess? Mm, I, do you know what? I always think it's really important to focus on 80%. And uh, I think one thing that turns people off from, um, you know, being more eco-conscious is they just think there's too much hard work. Um, there's too much pressure and I can't do it. Um, and they have this idea that you've got to be perfect. And I think we just need to let go of that mm -hmm. and to give people some free passes and a little bit of leg room that we can all give 80%, even 80% is quite high, let's say 70%. <laughs> and if we all gave 70%, that would be enough. Uh, and the problem with conservation is it's not black and white. They're, just by living and existing, we damage the environment. There's no way around that. We, we have an effect on the ecosystem. Um, so really it's just about looking at that and just looking at how you can reduce it uh, and like you say you know you can move to plant-based diet but there's still that still has an impact like all the plants we're eating still need to be um need to be grown and transported and things like that so if you aim for 70 percent I think you need to just look at what's important for you personally that's definitely what I did and I realized you know what I'm I'm very happy to go on a plant-based diet in fact I've really enjoyed moving to a plant-based diet which has been a surprise um I'm I'm really I love campaigning I love trying to have a positive impact in that way um I I, I like giving money to environmental um charities giving my time but the traveling is something that's really important for me that was hard to give up so I found a middle ground um and I thought you know I will fly less but I, I still will fly and that's okay because I make an effort in other areas so I would say just have a think about what's important for you and what areas um you can focus on um but let go of this idea of being perfect um and the other thing I'd say is just just positivity it's all about positivity I think we can get very down and bleak about the state of the world um and the environment environment uh and uh, that can just be like a really depressing dark hole to go into I've been there before where I just felt so hopeless like what's the point um that you forget to look at the bigger picture of the world which is I mean the reality is the, the world has been wiped out multiple times before um the dinosaurs were wiped out at some point in the future we will all be wiped out this is just the circle of earth um and life finds a way to come back uh, so really it's just about finding this balance in the meantime so that we can all maintain a healthy middle ground and thinking of the bigger picture might seem a bit crazy but actually for me it keeps me positive um, and just when you uh, when you start going on that journey just remember to try and be positive and gentle with other people because they're all at, at the journey at different points um, you know I've not I've not always been a vegan I've not always brought second hand um, but there were people who were positive and gave me that gave me time to educate me over on my journey and this is where I am now um so when you're sharing that with other people do so with kindness and compassion mm, that is sound advice I like that 70 or 80 percent that that's, that's very good cutting some slack almost you know um to give yourself some breathing room that's really good how have you found dealing with two years of COVID has that been an easy thing for you or has it presented challenges? 
Uh, no, definitely not easy. It's been the hardest two years, I think, of my life. Um, gosh, so many challenges. It's kind of a bit, um, I don't know, it's a bit like strange to look back on the last two years and to try and process all the different stages uh, and all the different feelings of, you know, I was really anxious in the beginning um, of lockdown. And then there were moments of real boredom and frustration and confusion. Uh, last year, weirdly the first year, although on, on a surface level, I feel like my emotions were all over the place and I, and I felt really anxious. It was last year that I really feel like it, the impact kind of hit me and um, I just felt, yeah, quite, quite down. And a lot of my motivation uh, was kind of gone. I feel like I'd lost my mojo a bit. Um, also, I had a daughter in my first daughter in, in the, in the first lockdown. Um, and so was also trying to adjust to being a mum and having those two things going at the same time was pretty full on and love her wild effectively had to collapse completely um which was really scary um being heavily pregnant and my career and business was collapsing you know it's a lot going on and it's been really tough um I think my adventuring and going on expeditions has given me great resilience and ability to remember two things no matter how bad it gets um one is that it will pass um which is um which is just like so important, wherever, wherever you're in the moment and it feels like unbearable, I just keep telling myself, um, this will pass. Uh, and the second is to really like look as small and narrow as you can and to be grateful for the positives that you do have. Because even in the midst where, of when it was mad and it, and it just felt too much, I could actually just sit down, ignore everything that's going on outside my door and just be really grateful for the sun that was coming in through the window or um, having my husband or, um, you know, even just a really comfy bed to wake up to. And just small things like that just really ground you and stop you from getting caught up in, in the bigger picture and the scary negativity that was going on um, and all the uncertainty. Um, and those are two things I learned on adventures that I think have served me really well and got me through the tough times. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel like it's going to take a couple more years to keep processing and to kind of kind of recover <laughs> um, and to, yeah, to, to catch up with like my energy levels to where I was before COVID. Mm. No, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, the reason why I ask is we all have this sort of common experience that we went through. And I think everybody had huge emotional turmoil. And certainly for those of us who are self-employed, that uncertainty of like, are we going to make it through? You know, we we're running a marathon, but we didn't know how long it was um, and whether mm. we, where the end really was. And I think that is where there is power in community. You know, um, absolutely, we have to sort of keep ourselves afloat in a financial sense, but we also have created our own retrospective communities where there's people who are, you know, hanging in there together. Um, and we can do that again as, as a shared species, even though, you know, at some point we are all going to not be here. <laughs> um, that is the flip side to it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a big deal. And I think, Again, I just I, it's, it's good to hear that bounce back and obviously that you, you've you made it through and hopefully Love for Wild can, you know, take on new angles and perspectives as well off the back of it. I think it's it's almost been like a shard of glass, hasn't it? And we're all sort of bouncing off in slightly different directions and it's going to just take a bit of time to recalculate. Um, and one of the ways, you know, you are doing that is obviously you're running Love for Wild, but you're also getting out for more adventures with your family as well. Um, so what have you guys been up to there, uh, sort of getting out with a young mm. daughter? Yeah, so that's, you know, I always knew having a child would change my adventuring. Um, and the biggest challenge really of getting out with a baby is just the logistics, because I, like I can carry all my tent and all the supplies that I need, but then carrying nappies all the supplies that a baby needs she eats a lot of snacks that little girl <laughs> like a lifetime supply of snacks and then also the baby herself <laughs> suddenly that's just like too much for me to carry um but we came up with an idea which was we'd seen people running with these off-road buggies um and we thought that, that looks like a great tool for adventuring so we got our hands on one of these um, three wheel off-road buggies. We piled it with all our camping gear 
enough snacks to keep her happy for a few days and then just about had enough space to perch the baby on top um, and then we headed to Dartmoor and found a cycle track because we thought well if bikes can go on it then probably a, a buggy can go on it as well um, and set off in Dartmoor for this multi-day hike and we were wild camping and it was absolutely brilliant um, we made sure there was a good weather window because I think that's quite important it wouldn't be so much fun um, keeping the baby happy and entertained um, in the rain um, but she absolutely loved it she set, slept amazingly in the tent she loved all the wild horses everywhere and just the, the free space to roam um, and we had a really good positive experience it's definitely challenging in places um getting the the buggy especially on like the really rocky tracks where if you're on a mountain bike it would kind of be fine but with the buggy um it took a little bit of maneuvering uh but it was possible um and so we're definitely planning to do another trip like that this year um we're actually heading to israel soon um to go stay with my in-laws and we're hoping to go back to the desert um and take rivi for a few nights hiking in the desert so that we can re relive our um israel trail days um we won't be able to take the buggy because the track is too small. So we're just aiming for very short distances. Um, and uh, what you get water caching in the desert where someone buries your water. Um, if you're doing any hiking, like designated camping areas, there's nothing in these areas. They're just they're literally normally just like a circle of, of stones just to contain um, any humans that are camping and staying overnight. Um, and so we've asked them to drop some food as well so that we have a little bit less to carry uh, so we'll see if that works out but it's really fun it doesn't bother me going slow and it doesn't bother me that um you know I can't quite have the same drive or distance that I did before because it, it's really true what they say that you see the world through um different eyes when you've got a baby because everything suddenly looks new and exciting that is so cool. I, I love that you guys are getting up and rising to the challenge, for lack of a better phrase, probably the wrong phrase, but, you know, adapting. <laughs> there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and I think, again, I think we can all we all have the changes in life that sometimes come our way, positive and negative. And I think there's always a way around them. Again, you know, with you and your husband being able to come up with those ideas together and tackle this new way of adventuring together and also creating those memories. I, I think that's so cool. And I can see the twinkle in your eyes as you talk about it. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's so good that you, you've, you've got that. Um, as we sort of begin to move to the end of this conversation, um, looking ahead at, at 2022, I alluded uh, in the introduction that you've got this end-to-end -end relay. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, it's a hike and re relay that was meant to happen two years ago, <laughs> but didn't. <laughs> um, so it's uh, 74 days, uh, two, over 2,000 kilometres, um, stretching the, the length of mainland UK. So starting in um, Land's End, going all the way to John O'Groats. And it's a hike and relay um, for women. And uh, women can sign up to come help carry the baton either a few miles or even a few days. They can choose the sort of distance that they want to do. Um, and these teams of women will come together um, across all 74 days um, to help keep this baton moving. Um, all money raised will go to the Woodland Trust, um, so a really great charity to support um, and it will also hopefully just provide a really exciting adventure um, and an opportunity for hundreds of women to get out of their comfort zone uh, to be part of a team and part of something um, big and exciting this year. So when does that all kick off? Um, so 16th of June it's starting in Land's End and then it's the end of August I can't remember the exact date that it finishes in John O'Groats. Oh brilliant and uh, how is um, how is gathering troops for this expedition going? <laughs> troops yeah, is the wrong yeah. word, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's going good. I think we're nearing 400 women signed up, wow. which is great because we only relaunched a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's going really well. It's been a big project, this. This was meant to all be tied up before, um, before my daughter was born. So obviously I didn't intend for it to drag on like for so many years. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been uh, quite emotional kind of struggling with that battle of should I try, should I postpone this still try and make it happen? Should I 
just cancel it um, and just draw a line under it. But I'm really pleased that I, I postponed it and kept it going because now it's up and running again. It just feels really good. And I can feel the energy and the excitement from the women that are signing up and they're getting you know excited about finding accommodation and um, you know being part of this and and you know looking for ways to make it even even more special and, and being part of that supportive team. Um, so yeah, I can't wait. It's an amazing thing to get stuck into. So if somebody does want to get stuck in, where can they find out more information? Sure. So um, if you head to the Love Her Wild website, which is loveherwild.com, uh, and on there you'll see there's a section for the relay where you can see a breakdown of the, the map and the route it's taken and um, uh, any, any questions and, and details that you need to find there. And for a personal question, can people get stuck in quite last minute? Because I'm not sure where I'm going to be. But <laughs> if I'm here, I want to get stuck in. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, some of our busy days will get will get um, booked up, especially the weekends. Um, but there will be no doubt there will be um, the odd spaces still going last minute, especially the the last couple of weeks in Scotland. Um, our proper rural rugged terrain um, and like middle nowhere like John O'Croats yeah. really is the end of the world <laughs> um, so that stretch will be especially quiet if anyone's looking for a real chat a real challenge <laughs> true. I mean, we cycled through there that's where we started Abbey Burke's Britain actually at John yeah. O'Croats and done it head and it is almost like another world it is so <laughs> and, barren and completely fascinating at the same time so maybe I will find an excuse to get back up there to be honest this is a, this is a good reason <laughs> good stuff well if you're ready we're going to jump into our 10 quick fire questions to wrap yeah. this thing up all righty so um question number one what was the last book that you read and loved uh things I learned from falling Oh, I saw this advertised. This is the last who, um, was it in the desert that she fell and was yes. there for a few days? Yes. And she's like, you think a book about someone falling and being stuck there for a few days would be boring. <laughs> she's a brilliant writer. Um, loved it. Yeah, I took a lot from that. Brilliant book. Well, I'm going to have to check that out. It's currently sat in the wish list of Audible. So maybe I'll just click purchase. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> um, question number two. Are you a morning or an evening person? I'm definitely a morning person. What sort of time do you like to rise? Um, well, I used to be seven. Now the baby gets me up at six. Um, but yeah, morning is my time to go for a walk, stretch, um, get my productive work done. By the evening, I'm just tired and just want a cozy night in. That's it. Snuggle <laughs> on the sofa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, third question. It's a bit of an odd one. If you were reincarnated as an ice cream flavor, what flavor would you be? Hmm, that is a tough one, but I would probably go for, well, my default is um, a, a, veg a vegan Magnum. They do a really Ooh. good vegan ice cream. Ooh. We saw that the other day. We haven't yet tried it, but it's on the list. <laughs> yeah, they're blimmin' expensive, but that's a good thing because it stops you eating them all in one go. <laughs> <laughs> Noted, and it's good to have the recommendation. As a side, actually, we, um, we just picked up some... Um, raw ice cream which is plant-based i don't know if you've seen it it's got a tiger oh, on it and oh so good they had like salted caramel and macadamia and it's just like yeah that, that does sound good did very quickly <laughs> <laughs> um all right so next question is what did you want to be when you were growing up oh it changed every week um <laughs> but a writer i wanted to be a pilot in the army um I wanted to, yeah, everything. I wanted to be a teacher. It literally changed every week. <laughs> a film director. That was a big one for a long time. Oh, nice. Well, you've, you've um, had your short film, First Mountain, out on YouTube, which I've very enjoyed watching. Um, really good yeah. story, that one. Although I didn't. Nick Nick Kane was the lady who made that. She's brilliant. But yeah, very it's, good film. It is a very good film, absolutely. Um, okay, brilliant. So next question is, what is your most unusual talent? um the only one I can think of is when I've had a few drinks I have a really good ability to get everyone synchronized singing usually to a queen song um on the dance floor that is incredible so a conductor as, much, <laughs> as well as everything else <laughs> <laughs> oh great um okay who has inspired you the most in your life 
Oh, that's that's another tough one. Um, I take a lot of inspiration from books and from individuals who are, you know, creating amazing things. Um, at the moment, I I'm just devouring all of Brené Brown's books. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, she's just, amazing, yes. isn't she? <laughs> Yeah. And I really, I just, it's like, I just feel like she's speaking to me in every page. Um, And so I'm really trying to live, um, you know, I'm trying to dare greatly and I'm trying to live like with vulnerability and trying to be courageous and honest. Um, And it just, it's an amazing way to live. So Brené Brown, top of the list. (laughs) Top of the list. I just like proper fan out about Brené Brown and just tell everybody about Brené Brown. So I'm so pumped and could quite happily Brené Brown geek out with you. (laughs) that's the next podcast (laughs) Uh, good stuff man okay when you're 80 years old what will matter to you most looking back on your life um I'd like to think uh two things that come to mind is family um and uh being there and being um a nice support to my husband and uh Rivi and any future children that I have and the second thing is using my time on earth to do positive and to bring more kindness and goodness to other people's lives. That's beautiful. Yeah. Very um, cheesy. <laughs> cheesy, but really good. <laughs> um, next question. What is your favorite food? Uh, do you know what? It, just oven chips. I don't know what oh, it is mate, about oven yes. chips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some nights I'm like, I'm just going to have oven chips for dinner. <laughs> uh, you're speaking my language with this. Like, <laughs> this. This makes my heart very happy. Even though my heart's on the other side for those watching the video. I do know anatomy. <laughs> um, we uh, One of our favourite things to make, it's not quite oven chips, but the sweet potato wedges. It's like a very oh, yes. almost every night thing. Yeah, that's for when you want to be a little bit more middle class. That you're yeah. like, oh, we'll go sweet yeah. potato True wedges. That. <laughs> Still good old oven chips. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um okay what is your favorite outdoor space um oh I'm a lover of deserts now just yeah just the consistent sun just those dry barren views just beautiful the sunrise the sunsets all about deserts incredible would you say then you're a preferred hiker in warm weather or do you prefer it to be cooler yeah, I am definitely a, a lover of the sun. Yeah. <laughs> I like hot weather. Oh, do you know what? After I said that, though, I was just like, oh, but oceans. I have a real love of uh, oceans, which is very conflicting, right? <laughs> it, <laughs> love it's oceans bit, yeah. and water <laughs> yeah, and deserts. Extreme. <laughs> well, fair enough. They're all good places. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, last question. Do you have any catchphrases or mantras that you live your life by? Um, yeah, so there's, I, I don't know it exactly, but Dumbledore um, has a great quote about um, it's our abilities um, who say who we, it's not our, it's our choices that say who we are as, as an individual, not our abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like that, especially, uh, I, I remember reading that at school um, and it really sticking with me um, at a time when my dyslexia my, my dyslexia uh, was meaning I was really struggling in my classes and it felt like I just wasn't good at anything um, and actually my life up until then has absolutely proven it's all about your choices in life it doesn't matter what your abilities are it's your choices that make you are who you are that's a really a really good I, I like that I, and I think that's an amazing way to end the podcast so thank you for answering those questions so very good answers um, and thank you for your time on on the show as well today um, do you have any sort of final thoughts or feelings or advice that you'd like to leave listeners with um, yeah I always say if anyone listens to a podcast like this or read something that they find inspiring just go be brave and take that first step. Um, I, I just, you know, used to devour podcasts and books and I used to daydream about all the things I wish I was doing and I, I just wasn't making them happen. Um, and now if I get any form of inspiration, any idea, I just take that brave first step and then the next step 
and the next step and just keep taking steps and before you know it you'll be there and you'll be making your dreams happen um so yeah bravery and small steps um and thank you very much for having me i really enjoyed this chat my pleasure it's been awesome well hopefully we'll have you on again soon and actually hopefully be seeing you in real life because that's definitely what matters most but um, absolutely thank you so much for your time today (laughs) thank you uh, get stuck in with the book people if you haven't already highly recommend um absolutely loved it so thank you for writing that and um we'll speak soon thank you bye-bye cheers thanks so much for listening to today's episode guys I really hope you've enjoyed it. And this is actually the final episode of season three of the One Wildlife podcast for 2022. We'll be back with season four a little bit later in the year. If you've been inspired by Bex and her story, then do pick up a copy of her book, Three Stripes South, and you can find out more information about her relay and other events, her speaking opportunities and more through her website, all of which you can find in the show notes. We'll see you later on in the year with season four. And until then, stay wild. Take care, guys.